Welcome back. Uh, Bikrus Hamzaev, the founder of World Influencers Network, is with you. And uh, we have an amazing session that I'm really looking forward. And uh, here we have a very interesting topic to cover. So I would like to introduce you Gary Abels, who is an internationally recognized expert on the future of the work and the future of learning. He focuses on the strategies helping individuals, organizations, communities, and countries to strive the transition to digital work economy. He is also a chair for the future of work for Singularity University. He leads an organization's efforts to empower a global community with a mindset, skill set, and a network to create an abundant future of work and learning. Welcome, sir. Welcome on our Thank you. It's a, thank you. And it's a pleasure for us uh, to have you here. And I think we're going to cover one of the, I think, most important topic in all of our discussion. We have, we've been having amazing speakers, but this conversation is really close to me and all digitalization and all digital economy related stuff, I'm, I'm just, I'm thick about it. So in a good way, uh, not COVID positive. So <laughs> our topic is a global, uh, global pandemic has served as a great reset and accelerating us toward the new world of work and the world will be never the same again. And uh, how we can restart our economies in a way that will ensure many people, as, as, as many people as possible, have access to meaningful, well-paid work. Before just jumping to our that conversation, I have a sort of a traditional question, sir. Where are you right now? In what city? And how the coronavirus affected your daily routine? So if you can just tell it a bit. So I'm in uh, San Francisco, um, uh, what, is, what has become the hub of Sil Silicon Valley. Um, I've actually, think of myself as I've, I've came to Silicon Valley, actually grew up in San Francisco, but I, I uh, moved to Silicon Valley uh, in uh, 1984. So, um, so I've seen a lot of, of tech cycles in that time. Uh, a lot of my work is, um, lecturing around the world. So I did 71 talks um, in nine countries last year. So uh, a lot of the talks I had scheduled for the first half of this year, as you would imagine, are, have all gone virtual. Um, so, so I'm like the rest of us, I'm not getting on a plane very often. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you if you'd picked a topic to be focused on, um, you know, a, a number of years ago, I actually was trained as a career counselor when I was 19, but I've uh, been focused on issues related to the future of work for the past uh, seven years now. Um, th this probably would have been one of the issues to be thinking about because um, we've been talking about so many of these uh, changes that we believe were going to come to work, uh, especially driven by exponential technologies. And then in a blinding period of time, <laughs> blindingly short period of time, suddenly now we're doing so many of the things that we've been talking about for so long. Um, we just, not all of us were prepared to do those things. So in certain way, it's the reset. I think it's a soft opening to our uh, core topic. So in that essence, what you think that res this reset button, it gives the reset to what? What we going to anticipate? What is going to be different? So if we can yeah. start. Yeah, good question. So the reason I call this a great re the Great Reset, um, that's actually the title of an article that I just posted on techonomy.com, uh, is because um, many people have talked about this like a pause. Um, it's as if we sort of froze everything and then it will just sort of restart. And I don't, I don't think that's, that's the way history tells us this happens. Um, what, what, what we're doing is we're going through a series of sort of fits and starts to a future that has some pretty predictable elements to it. Um, I don't think of myself as a futurist, I, but I, I maybe a near futurist, but I but, uh, certainly like to talk about, well, if we understand the major trends that are affecting our world now, we can actually draw sort of the red lines ourselves. We can see some of the ways that things are going to change, um, that are likely to change, you know, the most common scenarios. And then we can decide, is that the way we want the future to be, or do we want a different future? So the reason I call it the Great Reset is uh, we were sort of muddling along a path of using more digital technologies, each of us as individuals. Organizations knew that they needed to become more nimble and adaptive um, and resilient. 
our um, communities knew that we needed to have sort of more diversified access to work. Uh, our countries knew that we needed to have more inclusive policies for how each of us might be able to have access to meaningful, well-paid work. We knew all those things to be true, and then along came a virus. <laughs> so so uh, I don't think of this so much as many things we hadn't anticipated in terms of what we were going to all need to do. It's just that we didn't think it was going to happen so quickly. And And what you find is that in many cases, a lot of the practices, the use of digital technologies by individuals and the practices around becoming more nimble organizations, what ends up happening is we sort of resist change as humans, that's pretty common. But once you're either forced into the situation where you have to do it, or you see others doing it, you start to do it yourself, then that's when we see people adopting new behaviors. And so the example I use is um, these digital distraction devices that each of us carry around. Um, you know, it's only been 11 years since the iPhone was released. And you know, so, so let me tell you, so we, we, so we go back 11 years and I tell you, um, you're going to pick up this digital distraction device and you're going to hit a button and a car is going to arrive and a stranger is going to be driving it and you're going to open the door and, uh, he's, and you're going to say Becker's and he's going to say Gary and you're, you're going to get in the car. You might never say a word to each other. You're going to get out on the other end and you never exchanged a dollar. You know, you never share any other currency. So, so if I told you that 11 years ago, what are you going to say to me? You're going to say you're crazy. You're insane. My, my mother told me not to get into a stranger's car. <laughs> so, exactly. So, right. And so, so, but then when you start to see others doing it, you get all the social signals. Or when you suddenly can't find a cab, oh, well, I, I have to get it. Okay, I'm gonna hit the button. And so, so this is actually, we, we've hit the button. We've hit the reset button. We, we've decided um, as a, as a um, individual societies and economies and writ large across the world with half the people um, under uh, instructions to stay at home, literally half the people on the globe. I mean, that's never happened in the last one. That's uh, insane. History. And so, so what ends up happening is um, you, you, you get forced into new situations where you, going, you have to learn new behaviors. You've got to learn how to do video conferencing. You've got to learn how to be able to have distributed teams that can effectively coordinate together. As an organization, you've got to figure out how do we keep the lights on? Like, how do we keep on doing the work of our work? But then what are the ways we're going to start to prepare when hopefully we are able to all start to interact together without, uh, without having to the shelter in place. And so, so that's why it's a big reset. And, and I'll talk more about what I think is going to last, but those are some of the things that are inevitable. We're going to be more distributed. We're going to hopefully have more, more, more teams that are used to being um, remote from each other. We're going to have organizations that will have practices that will allow them to become more new. Yeah, but uh, Gary, those things you're talking about is, I, I call it, I call them optimization and they're like short term, right? That it, yeah. it's got a new skill set. It's a new skill set we just adopt toward that and yes it's some in certain way um, those things will transform a little bit adjust the to new era but what is really transition what is a bigger picture here what is the future of the work especially yeah. in the meantime if a lot of let's say people don't need to travel because it's a you know you can do this presentation online, you don't necessarily have to come to Tashkent, although we would love to see you in Tashkent, but those people who are going to serve you along the way, the guy, Uber guy you were talking about, what if he got his Tesla Autopilot 5 and that guy lost his job? And uh, many other things, many other automation, right? We say automation, anything computer can do next 10 years, it will do. So we're going to lose that. So what will be that new realm so how we yeah. how is the future of the world what is the future of the world? so uh, it, it, there's a there's a common phrase that's commonly um attributed to rob emmanuel um uh, ne basically along the lines of ne never let a good crisis go to waste um so so we actually have the opportunity in the great reset to completely rethink work and rethink the purpose of organizations so um so what is work if you're going to talk about the future of work, maybe it's important to sort of break down what work is. So work is basically just mechanically three things. It's a problem to be solved. It's the tasks, the steps we follow as humans to solve those problems. And then it's our human skills. So really it's 
problems to solve that our human skills can solve. Well, what we do is we throw robots and software at the tasks, and then we revamp jobs, which are just the use case for work. And so what the, what the future holds for us is to completely revamp the way we think about what work is and become very problem centric. What are the problems that we're trying to solve? What are the human skills that we can bring to solve those problems? And because the problems are on a constantly changing landscape, customers always want something new. And our skills are on a constantly changing landscape. As humans, we're always learning and developing. Then what you've got is you can think of it as, here's all the demand, all the problems in the world to be solved. Here's all the supply as humans with our skills. We're constantly figuring out how to optimize that. So the future of work for individuals is where you will need to become extraordinarily nimble to be able to continually find new problems that customers are going to want you to solve. The, 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 there's tons of jobs and, and uh, work and problems that we've been solving in the past that, that robots and software are going to solve. They're going to perform those tasks. And so as humans, to stay ahead of it, we're going to need to develop a new skill set, a new mindset and a new skill set. For organizations, well, what's an organization? An organization is essentially an aggregation of human beings that are channeling their human energies to solve problems. So we just choose to call them organizations and we choose to have hierarchies and we choose to have jobs, which I said are as a use case. And well, those are all sort of holdovers from this thing called the, um, uh, the, the, the third industrial era. And so, so instead, we have the chance to revamp all of those things. We have the chance to unbundle organizations and become what I call the network with a capital N and capital W, where it's no longer just this hierarchy and what I think of as a box, the organization with hard edges. No, it's a range of different human beings that are helping you to solve a variety of problems. Sure, you'll have employees, but you're also going to have contractors. You're also going to have part-timers. You're also going to have gig workers. You're going to have people that you uh, find on platforms. You're going to have crowdsourced work. You're going to have your customers. You're going to have your partners. There's this wide range, a portfolio of different talent and workers to be able to solve the problems of your organization and your customers. And so the organizations that will succeed in the future will be those ones that actually think of themselves as a network think of themselves as a range of different customer problems to be solved. And then they're optimizing, they're bringing in the right talent to solve those problems in the right way, at the right price, in the right kinds of processes. So basically what I hear from that, what I can take from that is you are basically saying that we have to completely kind of change our mindset. And what is our mindset is our, which leads to our education, isn't it? So, for the future of the work, there is a future of the education. It should change too. So what is the role of the education and how it's going to be pivotal and how it's going to transform? So I, I, I don't talk as much about education. I talk about learning mm -hmm. because education is, is something we've sort of embodied as a thing. And there's no question, you know, and, and education as a noun is a great asset for anybody to have. But if we think of ourselves as being in a world of constant and exponential change, um, the, the, that exponential curve is only increasing. Um, and we think of work as being the need to be able to continually find new problems to solve, then what, what do we need to, how, how do we need to learn as, as humans? Well, in the past, we used what my, my father, who was an author of job hunting books, uh, called um, the three boxes, where we had a big chunk of education at the beginning of our lives, then a big chunk of work, and then a big chunk of leisure in what I call the period formerly known as retirement. Well, that might have made sense with the old rules of work when you were going to stay in one job in one field, one industry for a long period of time. But in a world of constant change, having just that big box of education at the beginning of your life and then kind of nothing after that doesn't make any sense. I, there's no field or industry I can tell you that will guarantee you'll have exactly the same job in 10 years. I just, I just can't guarantee that anymore. So learning needs to become a lifelong process. And, and we have to start off by learning how to learn. We, I've got a, a, a nine courses on LinkedIn learning, but one of them is developing a learning mindset. And so one of the first steps is how do you as a human being, how are you optimized for learning? Like what is the, what are the ways you learn best? How do you develop new skills? How do you gather new information? How do you solve problems? 
And so learning how to learn is step one, but then becoming a lifelong learner and continually being curious about the problems that you most want to solve and then gathering information, what is going to happen to education is going to shift to a set of new models. Um, and you can think of the most common model as being uh, just in time and just in context. So you, you will find the information you need to solve that problem right in front of you. So it's just in time. I didn't go get a four-year IT degree. I learned exactly how to be able to fix this one particular computer. Um, and it's just in context. I'm not trying to learn everything there is to know about IT. I'm trying to learn how to fix this computer in front of me. So there's things you gain. You gain speed and you gain specificity in terms of solving particular problems. What you lose is the more generalized sort of learning and education. And so that's what we'll need to make sure as societies and economies we keep is that there's always things that we're curious about that don't necessarily apply to the work that you most want to do. That's what makes a whole human being. And so we have to make sure that we don't lose those aspects as we become much more focused on just in time and just in context learning. Well, this is an amazing conclusion. And that actually you always step to my next question or the premise I was talking about then if no education, then it's a three L's, life, learn, uh, lifelong learning. So you learn all the time. A degree, a bachelor, master's in any field doesn't guarantee you anything. And your relevant sphere today, for instance, uh, accountants or drivers or the lawyers and AI is going to eat this job in next, what, 10 years, 20 years? Who knows? And it's not relevant anymore, although you spent you know, bunch of money on a very high prestigious Ivy League universities. And in that premise, I think I'm going to do a little collision of your idea or what you think with your good friend, I believe, Ray Kurzweil, who is the uh, future, futurist. And yeah. he has a really interesting ideas. And he also, he really waiting for the moment of uh, singularity, right? When the computer capacity of processing, it will exceed human brain. So if let's say computer can do my job better, or any given job better, even thinking, uh, will there any work will be left for people to do? So I have, I've had this discussion with Ray before. Um, so Ray's the co-founder of Singularity University, uh, where I'm the chair for the future of work. And so here's, here's, I'm going to give you two ways to, that I think about this. So okay. the first is that um, if you think of uh, work, uh, the, the combination of the problems to be solved and, um, and the tasks that we perform, if you think of it as um, these are the problems to be solved from really repetitive down here to very unique problems, and these are the tasks we perform from very repetitive to very unique tasks, right? So... So down here, where it's the same problem over and over again and performing the same task to solve the problem, that's the, role, the realm of robots and software. So mm -hmm. gone. Yes. Whether it's on a factory floor or it's in a white collar job, if you're doing it over and over again, like processing expense reports, or you know, that is going to be done by robots and software. So any repetitive work will be gone to robots. We're giving them away. Yeah. Done, okay. done. And so, and there will be increasingly be problems that are being solved that are a little more unique or, you know, so, so there's no question that artificial intelligence and machine learning software will get better and better at those things. But way up here where it's unique problems to solve and unique tasks to be performed, that's the realm of humans because that's where you use your, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about um, the, the, the future skill set being pace. Um, and in English, that's uh, problem solvers who are adaptive creative and with empathy. So a problem solver, because that's why people pay us and that's why, why we pay other people is to solve problems. Adaptive, because the exponential curve is not gonna slow down, we're gonna need to continually adapt. Creative, because that's what allows us to be in that upper quadrant, we're creative problem solvers. It's really hard to get robots and software to do that and it will be for a long period of time. And then with empathy, because that's what makes us human. Um, it's the understanding of a customer's problem, the understanding of a human's problem uh, that allows us to be able to continually ensure that we're solving the most important problems. And so problem solvers are adaptive, creative, and with empathy. Robots can't do that. 
and won't be able to do that for a long period of time. Now, what Ray is talking about is that the raw computing power and the performance of software is just going to get so much better that it will perform more and more of those tasks, remember? But, yeah. but what he also talks about, he's very clear, is that there's actually two different approaches to this. One is where we're going to use all that software to take all these tasks and it will do more and more tasks and just keep on encroaching on human work. But there's a completely different way of thinking about this, and that's that software and essentially technology can help give us superpowers. It can help us develop superpowers. It can help us learn new superpowers. And so imagine that you had an AI coach, and the AI coach said, listen, I've been watching the way you've been solving this. You could solve this problem in a different way. Or wait a minute, here's some information you really need to be able to solve this problem. Or the AI coach said, I listen, I know you want to eventually become a master programmer. Here's a new course that you could be looking. What if you had that kind of capacity where the technology was actually helping to enhance you as a human, help you to continually do better and better at that upper quadrant, uh, being a, a, a problem solver who's adaptive, creative, and with empathy. So, so that's actually where the real opportunity lies, is more and more of these technologies that Ray, Ray is talking about, where we have better and better microprocessors and better and better AI software, to help us to solve new problems. Well, that's an interesting notion. Then, okay, it's like we're talking about for more fundamental stuff and we're talking about like more of the future, like midterm, long-term future. But in your thinking, out of your experience, what are the hip pocket skills for the next 10 years? for next five years to stay relevant, right? Because, well, we understood that there is no single solution fit for all. We understood that there is, you know, Harvard degree will not give you a guarantee that you are okay. So, but in that essence, is there any skill set? And if there are any skill set, what is the lifespan of the skill set you have? And when you have to say, okay, now I have to learn something else. Yeah. So let me just break down, you know, if we're talking about what work is, let's talk about what skills are, right? So there's research that goes back uh, literally 70 years uh, to World War II, uh, post-World War II, that breaks skills down essentially into two different bins. And it's really important to think about how different those skills are. And nobody tells us this when we're young, nobody helps us to sort of figure this out, but they fall into two different bins. One bin is a bunch of knowledge, like a body of information that is sort of anchored in a field. So when you talk about skills, often what we're talking about is we say, oh, the knowledge of law, the knowledge of accounting, the knowledge of repairing vacuum cleaners. That's a body of knowledge. And, and it's not usually usable in another place, right? If you know how to repair a vacuum cleaner, it's probably not going to help you to do brain surgery, or at least I hope it doesn't. Um, <laughs> So, so, so those are anchored, right? So, so one set of skills is knowledges, but there's this other set of skills that are transferable, that are usable in a range of different situations. Um, so those ones that I mentioned, being a problem solver, adaptive, creative, and so on, those are all transferable skills. So uh, hmm. chances are good if when you were young and your parents wanted you to go to bed, uh, say at the age of five, and, and you tried to persuade them to let you stay up a little bit later and suddenly you did oh you learned a new transferable skill mm -hmm. you're probably going to be good at persuading in a lot of different situations you okay. could become a salesperson you could become a um a business development person uh, you could become a politician well okay don't become a politician <laughs> but 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 you'll you'll be good at persuading <laughs> in a range of different situations so what you're talking about in terms of the skills to learn in bodies of knowledge what we know is that the shelf life of knowledge in a range of industries is decaying rapidly. So to become lifelong learners, to become ongoing learners, you've got to stay curious, even if you were trained in a particular field, so that you're continually solving the new problems that software isn't solving. And so, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you any particular field that you should be focusing on. It's more driven by your own passion, right. by the kinds of problems you like to solve with your transferable skills, and then the bodies of information of the fields that you're most passionate about. But if you marry these, and obviously you've guessed, we call these hard skills and we call these soft skills, which are bad labels. It's better knowledge is and transferable. But, but the basic premise 
is that you've got to find an arena that you're curious about, you're fascinated about, where you will constantly be learning the next thing. It's when you focus just on what the current state of the art is and you aren't curious about where it's going and you're not continually learning about it, that actually the world starts to leave you behind. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> your previous talk led me to my next question and I think I'm gonna start a little war here. Uh, we were separating for now. We were saying, okay, AI, AI separately and EI separately, right? Artificial intelligence, emotional intelligence. We human beings, emotional intelligence, we're good at it, we're empathetic, and we're gonna, this is our hip pocket skill. And it's okay that robots are working in the factory. We don't wanna drag that old heavy stuff, let the robots do it. But what is your thinking about the company called Neuralink, mm -hmm. who, which is trying to merge it, marry that. Do you think it's a good idea or are we about to open up the Pandora box? And is yeah. the Elon Musk right about it? <laughs> so Elon basically says he thinks jobs are gonna go away. I mean, he says, well, if you wanna do any job today, you should be uh, an AI programmer, but even that'll go away because eventually AI will be writing AI. So uh, first off, I think a lot of that talk is about a failure of imagination. We, you know, if, if we went back 150 years and tried to envision our world today and all the jobs of today, we would have had a failure of imagination. So, so we have a failure of imagination even looking 30 years down the road, right? We don't, mm. we don't, we don't have the language or the not understanding of how work is going to change so much. We just have some of the signposts. So what, what you, when you talk about Neuralink and about any of the um, uh, computer brain interface opportunities or anything like that. So I think there's a couple different ways to think about that. So first off, when any, any technology potentially enhances us as humans, such as being able to allow us to learn faster, allow us to back up our knowledge or in any way to be able to extend our capacity. Um, you know, it, we, we, have, we have technology called a pen that extended our capacity. <laughs> we, could, we could have written with our fingers, but that's not all that you know, useful. So a pen extends our capacity. Um, so that when you think of these access to the, the, the um, you know, things like these digital distraction devices that allow us to be able to gather information more quickly or store information uh, more effectively, then that's just going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that um, that will be more and more effective with either non-intrusive um, brain interface uh, devices or with intrusive brain interface devices that actually would be, you know, like a chip that you put in your brain. I, you know, we can, we can talk about whether or not these are good or bad ideas for society as a whole, and we need to. We need to talk about what humans will become. There's this sort of transhuman sort of discussion, I think, that Ray has in part sparked. But really, if what we do is we say well, we're trying to anchor ourselves as humans, where what we're really doing is we're, we're augmenting ourselves. Like that, yeah. we are trying to continually increase our capacity as humans to be able to solve new problems. Where I have a challenge is when we treat the technology as a thing that is separate from us, and then we elevate it to our level. So when people talk about partnering with technology, I, I refuse, you know, I just, I, 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 I don't agree with any of that mentality. Technology is our, it, it provides tools for us. It aids us. It's not our equal. So we don't, humans don't partner with technology. Now, when we use a technology and we have better access, or be better access to information, or it has better access to us, and that is enhancing us and allowing us to be able to solve problems in new and different ways, I'm all for it. Where we are saying, no, we're gonna create a robot and the robot's gonna be equal to a human, and it's, you know, then those, those types of things, as far as I'm concerned, are a very slippery slope, because essentially what it does is, as we elevate the technology, we diminish humans. And I think it's gonna, well, there are many movies, <laughs> there are many different scenarios that show us what would happen and there are very few movies with happy ending about that. So we can actually <laughs> let that imagination to see. But what I, I like your idea of, uh, because if we give, and we, we are ego animals, right? The animals with ego. And if we're giving the ego to our devices, then it's going to be a conflict of egos and you know it, it, 
it never it never worked that uh, if there are two bigger egos one should go so <laughs> i don't know so which leads me to my next question then so it, there is another buzzword uh, out there when we speak about the future of the work i hear this from many people i try to grasp and force myself to say well they're speaking and maybe this is it but i'm not 100 percent sure and convinced by that idea maybe you will convince me universal basic income yes or no so well, I, i've actually written on this so what i say is universal basic income is a tool um and uh it, but but many people unfortunately think of it as uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, um, the answer to the wrong question. The question should not be, will robots and software take all of our jobs? Oh, what are we gonna do with humans? We've got to give them a universal basic income. We've got to give them money because they can't make money any other way. As we've seen with the Great Reset, we do need, as, as uh, economies and as societies, we do need to support people. Uh, but what we really need to do is support paychecks, right? The, the, the Nordic countries and Germany and uh, actually the UK as well, their approach to the Great Reset has been, let's keep people in jobs and we'll give money to the companies so that they continue to have those jobs. A universal basic income or any process that gives money directly to human beings, there are circumstances where that's actually really important and really useful. But when you've got a job, we want to keep you in a job. That's mm -hmm. really what the mentality needs to be. So I say universal basic income, a UBI, might be one of the right answers. It might be a tool in the toolkit, but it's the wrong question. It's not, will robots and software take all, all jobs? It's, should every human being have access to meaningful, well-paid work? And I believe that that's true. And so, so we, we don't want any human being to go to bed at night without a roof over their heads. We don't want any human being to go to bed without having eaten a meal. So if those are the ways that we want to design our societies and our economies, let's think of all the tools in the toolkit that ensure that we leave no human behind. That's really the mentality that I want to encourage. So what I heard is that it's a tool, it is essential, but it is a part of the solution. It cannot be a universal solution. And certain countries, certain sectors, or maybe certain periods, we can apply it but it should not be the only solution, is it? What you don't want to do is to create any kind of dynamic where you've essentially segmented an economy and said, um, you know, we're going to, well, there's some group of people where we're just, we don't think they're ever going to be able to work or they're not going to be all that functional or um, you, you, you're a fan of science fiction. So there's a movie called Elysium. Yeah. Matt Damon, where yeah. all the rich people go up on a satellite and all of the poor people are down on the earth. Yeah, working and, for uh, each people, yeah. Right, exactly. So we don't I, don't, I don't like the Elysium scenario. That's not, you know, I, um, what, what's more likely, um, I've, I've written a piece and I lecture frequently about what I call the three futures of work. You know, one future is robots and software take all the jobs. Another future is, no, 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 AI creates a new, you know, uh, uh, beautiful future for humans. But the third future is the most likely, which is where there's a bunch of people with skills and there's a bunch of demand, but they're not well matched. That is, we haven't helped to train people to solve the new problems and you can't find enough people to solve the new problems. So you've got a whole bunch of people that are unemployed, you got a whole bunch of job openings and they're not matching up. So with the Great Reset, we suddenly shut down all the job openings. Like there's just very few, there's still something, you know, some people are hiring, but there's a lot less. But when the economies all, when our economies all start up again, then what will end up happening is you're going to have that mismatch. And so that's really what we need to design for is you're going to have a constant mismatch where there are going to be people who were doing work, they were paid really well, and then the factory shut down or the mine went away or, you know, the um, as AI software is writing AI, AI software. And so how will we help humans to continually move this way to be lifelong learners, to have the technologies that they need to support them, to have the income when they can't find the work that they need while they are preparing themselves for the work that they need. So we have to revamp our educational systems. <laughs> We've got to revamp the ways that we think about how we're designing our economies to make sure that those people are all included. Okay, great. Uh, I cannot miss this question. Also, I'm from this country, from Uzbekistan, and I've been a long advocate of digitalization. I was, uh, I was promoting that government 
will go online and government services should be online and government should adopt the digital technologies as fast as possible. I was outlining it as a silver bullet. Actually, this is our magic bullet for us to go from emerging market to developing or developed market. And uh, there are so many other countries which are similar to my country. So do you think this premise, the idea of digitalization is actually a new gold or new source for the countries or new oil that can ramp up the economy? And should the government switch to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we see efforts all around the world. You know, I'm ad advising a couple of different um, groups with the Brazilian government. Um, we're advising uh, a large um, jobs initiative in Ethiopia. What we see in, in countries all around the world is um, a tremendous amount of opportunity. Now, um, when you look at Estonia, for instance, which is obviously the sort of the poster child for digitization, <laughs> Um, smaller, smaller economy, you know, under a million and a half people. So, so in some ways easier to do, or you look at Singapore, a slightly larger economy, but, but, um, it's sort of a larger population, but, but, you know, highly digitized, um, no question that it can have a tremendous transformative effect. The, the, the challenge is how to get there because, uh, you know, that each era has a set of baseline skills. And you know that there are certain processes that everybody is going to need to be able to follow, to be able to be as nimble as possible. So if we could have waved a magic wand uh, even a year ago and made every government in the world uh, more digitized, more nimble, more adaptive, we would have wished we had done that because now we're dealing with things like, you know, in the U.S., we're trying to use an overloaded unemployment system to get checks to people. We're trying to use an overloaded small business administration to try to get checks to people. And, and the systems just can't scale to do that. And so absolutely, at the macro level, what countries need to do is to embrace digitalization. And that means sort of a leapfrog process, very, very hard, because they've got older systems. They haven't necessarily funded the big leap forward. And then for individuals, must learn digital skills, it's a baseline. You've got to be comfortable with the uses of technology. And for organizations, we must become more nimble and adaptive. And that's going to mean using a wide range of different technologies to be able to enable teams to be more distributed, to be able people to, to, to enable people to find problems to solve and to be able to have the right person suddenly jump in and helping to solve those problems. Sir, it's like talking to a soulmate. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so thankful and, <laughs> For me, it's like a preaching, you know, I think the verses from some Hollywood. I, 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 I cannot agree more with everything you said. And I, I wish that my government and all the governments and emerging markets will adopt the digitalization as soon as possible. This is amazing talk. I can talk for hours. I, I, I could not be more grateful to, so, to such a person as you who can keep up telling us so many things. We'll learn a lot from you. And I'm, I'm sure that in one hour we cannot learn. So we'll make sure that we will put a link down below to uh, professors all work and you can contact him on uh, see his fabulous work on YouTube on TEDx and on other platforms and meanwhile if you condense it down as a like first principle right if you boil it down what suggestions you want to say to let's say world leaders the big guys are making decisions although you said don't go to politics sir we need smart people in government. We need smart people in polit politicians. So I urge oh, no, people absolutely. to go. No, it, it, it's a, it, yeah, it's a cheap joke. So no, absolutely. <laughs> we need lots of, we need great problem solvers in, uh, in politics. Um, so so um, when I talk about the domains of the future of work, I talk about four. I say individuals, organizations, communities, and countries. And so... There are things to do, very important things to do at each one of those levels, but I'll just tell you very quickly. For individuals, yes. um, we all want access to meaningful, well-paid work today and tomorrow. So you need to continually be curious and adaptive um, and, and learn how to solve new problems. For organizations, they're always going to want to find talented people, so they need to have much more inclusive processes and hopefully the ability to hire people in much more distributed manner now and uh, during the great and after the great reset communities want to be ecosystems where everybody can thrive so communities need to figure out ways where they can continually connect 
people um, so that, that they're, they're, everybody is involved. And then finally, for countries, it's all about building inclusive economies. So this is one of the opportunities of the Great Reset is in each one of those different arenas to reinvent how we approach solving problems. And especially for those country leaders, how can you design the, the post-reset economy so that it's more inclusive, so that it's more resilient, so that it's more prepared to be able to deal with these shocks? Because today it's a virus, tomorrow it's going to be generalized AI. You know, we're going to have these shocks in the system are going to happen over and over again. And we need our governments and our leaders to be as resilient as possible as well. I think nothing can be topped to that. So, sir, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And I hope this conversation will take uh, one more time or several other times. I really count on your expertise for this time being Mera. Thank you very much for all the effort and uh, hope to talk to you in the very uh, near future. That's good. So great to meet you, Bikrudis. Okay. Thank you very much, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right.